<clears throat> All right, this is a design from a trust call on Monday, September 2nd, 2019. Our topic is why haven't wikis eaten the world? Um, and I think there are a few of us on the call who are wiki enthusiasts. I know that there's a, a couple wiki ninjas, in fact, here. Um, and just trying to figure out um, Wikipedia eight encyclopedias, why aren't we all using wikis to collaborate? And uh, that's kind of the starting point. And Dave Witzel, who's on the call, had asked this question on a mailing list that I run. Uh, hey, there's Graham with Travis. Um, and, uh, and basically, it's a great question. And there's lots and lots of people on this list who care about the topic. So uh, we started going at it. And I thought, hey, why don't we just put together a call here uh, about this thing? And what I'd love to do is just, um, hey, Pete. Uh, what I'd love to do is just uh, right away uh, invite people to jump in and uh, and ask questions. Actually, uh, one one thing first, uh, Dave. Okay, if we share a link to the document you started with this group, and could you want to post that on the chat? Yeah, that'd be great. Awesome, thank you. And, then, uh, so, and I'll just can I just say one word about what the where the question came from? I think I'll hand the mic directly to you. Okay. No, I just because I ended up in a conversation with. Um, there's this group that's doing a, a, a kind of a global collaboration network around the new economy um, called, called the Wellbeing Alliance. And they're trying to do a tools kind of component of the service they're offering to all these different organizations. And they're in the process of designing these tools. And, and I was laughing because it was like, wow, these are exactly like the websites we would have designed in 1995, you know, uh, and, and I'm, and I'm saying, well, this, and it won't work, right? We know it won't work. And then, and then he said, but you know, what will work? And it was like, well, I don't know, actually. And so and he asked it, particularly in the context of wikis. So, um, so one is he's got a real question and it's a really interesting project and I'd love to help him answer it. Uh, and I did send him the document and I'll do better to edit and stuff. And then I also gave him the link to this chat. So it's possible that he'll drop in on the chat, but it was very last minute. And, um, Anyway, and, and then I also thought there is something interesting. I would love to be able to take questions like this. The group answer was so interesting, I thought, that if you could capture it and use it again, it just seemed like it would be a valuable thing. So I thought this would be an interesting test to see if we could come up with a, you know, interesting answer to the question and then just publish it somewhere. So that, that's another thing kind of hanging out there. That sounds lovely. So I think one of our, one of our potential objectives here is to co-author a post that we can place on the Design from Trust website on wherever wherever we'd like. We can cross post it lots of places. But I think that the, the Google Doc that Dave just shared in the link uh, is possibly the seed for such a collaboration. Or maybe it's a series of small, you know, of six small articles, each of which take a bite out of the out of the, the, the question. And we pair up and, and decide which parts of this we're interested in. But keep that in the back of your minds uh, as we talk, just in case. Uh, I note that we are all like guys here. It's funny that this invitation didn't kick up any women. And I know that there are women on the retreat list who are like ninjas for this kind of collaboration. So I'll just, I'm going to say that out loud uh, and cross my fingers that that uh, some of our uh, women friends join the, uh, the conversation. Um, Bill, you've been, I think, wikiing more intensely than anybody else I know besides uh, Michelle Bowens and Ward himself. Um, uh, do you want to just jump in and t say a little bit about your personal experience and share the link to SitesWiki on on uh, in the chat so we, you know anybody can who doesn't know what you've built uh, can go wander. Uh, sure. Uh, interestingly, or not interestingly, uh, my personal focus has been on what. Some people wouldn't even call a wiki because it's really a single author environment. Uh, I've been doing most of my writing for the last 17 plus years in, uh, I have a, a wiki, what I call a wiki log, which is basically a blog that's built on top of a wiki engine. So it has the hypertexty aspects of a wiki, but I'm the only person who can write in it. Uh, a decade back, the version that I was using allowed anybody to append a comment to the bottom of it. But one of the patterns with uh, public wikis is that they get spam magnets. And so people end up, even the, even Ward's original wiki basically doesn't operate anymore as an interactive site because they just gave up on fighting the, the battle of attrition with spammers posting to, to wiki pages. Uh, and then the other parallel thing that I have is uh, a private wiki notebook 
which is basically just my daily journal and sort of, you know, life management process, which again, because I'm really just a hypertext junkie, Wiki is the medium I've found most effective for that. And then every job that I have, uh, if they don't already have a Wiki in place, I put one in place and I probably end up writing 80% of the content in there. <laughs> and so that again is kind of a uh, data point in terms of the difficulty in getting other people to uh, engage in, in stuff. And even when there'll be a couple people that I'll do some adding to Wiki um, and I sort of have to fight the urge to nag them uh, because it's a fragile enough, you know, uh, engagement that even though they may have horrible page titles and not link to anything else and not style anything at all, or just sort of dump a bunch of word notes in there, uh, you know, it's better than nothing in a sense of creating some sort of record. And sometimes I'll um, fix it, you know, sort of fix the title or add a link in their page to some other related topic or something like that. So at least it's not a completely, uh, you know, orphaned, Google Doc, you know, that happens to be in a wiki page. Uh, so I've, you know, in in my private writing, in my wiki log writing, uh, I was part of, of various communities like Lion Kimbrough's group that was talking a lot about social technology tools and things like that. And my model uh, very quickly became basically the attitude of uh, oh, everybody should have their own wiki uh, and, and essentially look for ways to connect across those spaces. And Ward's recent work is actually in that direction with his federated wiki model, which basically uses a single platform, but then that platform encourages people to essentially fork every page so that they take, they find one person who's written a page and they essentially copy it into their own space and then they can make changes to it to suit their particular needs. And then that person could either copy it back into their space, or you can sort of follow that in, in sort of a platform-wide recent changes model. So you can see all the different flavors of a given page that exists. Um, strangely enough, when I look at the work that's been happening there, number one, they tend to spin off a lot of sort of short-lived single topic wikis. And so there's not a lot of sort of building uh, of, a, of an intellectual asset over time. And the other thing that I notice is that, um, they tend to have rather sort of long, strange page names. Uh, and so therefore nothing would ever link back into it. Like every page is kind of like a, a hub that could link into other general pages, but those other general pages don't tend to exist. Um, my style of writing is typically to start with kind of an anchor page and then have articles that link into it. And most of my sort of original writing happens in that anchor page which is sort of like my gloss on it, which then links off to other stuff. And in a lot of the sites that Ward's uh, platform has uh, encouraged, I see the bush pages without the, without the hubs. And so you end up with, again, a series of kind of not connected pages. And so uh, that to me seems like it doesn't get a kind of critical mass of attention either. And I think, I think what all these things are trying to fight with is the issue that any document is essentially a gloss or a model of reality, either current reality or envisioned reality. Uh, and if you don't have a process that creates a group kind of convergence of thought around that, then it's going to tend to devolve into sort of different incompatible ideas trying to mesh on a page, which either results in one document that has 20 different visions in separate paragraphs, or somebody becomes the obnoxious editor who's imposing their view on that page and everybody else gets pissed off. And so um, the place where I would expect to have more success are in those product building business wikis because they're driven by having to actually build something. And so somebody's trying to converge kind of a vision there, and then that should be driving the model, you know, and then makes, it makes variations on that vision more explicit and resolvable. Um, but again, the, 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 the other dimension is that fact that most people don't seem to want, think in terms of sharing information. Uh, and so there's kind of like, no matter what you hit, you hit a scale problem or you hit a divergence problem. Absolutely. Um, and, and Pete, you've started a company around corporate wikis uh, and a bunch of other things. Do you wanna jump in? And you also just uh, posted a whole bunch of stuff uh, on, the, on the retreat list about uh, a, a sort of reflections on this whole thing, but if you just want to put a stake in the ground uh, here and then I'll just open the mic to whoever wants to jump in. Yeah, sure. Um, uh, so for better or for worse, I, I ended up getting what I wanted to write down 
um, shipped to the list 10 minutes before this call. So nobody's gotten to read it yet. Um, I, I think at, at least some of us have a vision of kind of a, sh uh, there's, there's a thing out there, the thing without a name maybe, um, which is a collaborative wiki where uh, you get kind of a group brain working together. Um, and certainly we had that in inside uh, the Corp Wiki at Social Text. Uh, we, you know, we ran a couple year experiment with Social Text, um, having most of the most of the communication and collaboration for the company working through a wiki and and also a set of IRC channels. Um, it turns out you need semi synchronous as well as as uh, asynchronous. Um, but um, uh, we replaced email, we, we replaced Word, we replaced uh, PowerPoint with just the wiki, Corp Wiki. Um, and we had that success with a lot of our customers too. Uh, not, ev not every customer was able to, um, to kind of get the uptake and make it into the, the same kind of experience we had with uh, our own wiki. But there were, um, I, I thought, a kind of a surprising number of, of folks who did. Uh, we also had customers who took our wiki and made something different from it. Um, uh, one of those patterns actually I really like, uh, which was we had such a simple technology at the beginning that people would invent, normal people using the wiki would invent uh, essentially applications on top of the wiki, like a workflow manager or uh, an order processor or things like that. And um, from that, I learned that giving people a limited tool set and the power to kind of innovate with, you know, within that tool set um, uh, gives them a lot of power, empowers them, and creates things that you wouldn't have imagined, you know, as as use cases, uh, because people who are using stuff know their use cases best. Um, so that's kind of the good news. I think the bad news is after 15 years of of thinking about wikis and how they work and why they don't. Um, the thing that I learned is that people don't look, really collaborate as well as it seems like they ought to. Um, and there's lots of reasons for that. There are a large number of uh, kind of accommodation techniques you can use to turn low performing community, low, you know, low uh, collaboration performing community into a, a higher um, uh, performing collaboration community. Um, uh, and I think collectively kind of, we all know what those are. I think they haven't been shared widely enough and maybe this is, you know, the beginning of something where we can share more and more of those. I would love that. Um, I also observe that even though that the, the technologies, the know-how is out there, the will to do it um, is lacking, I think. I, I, I see time and again, I, I'm working with an organization um, I push a little collaboration technology into their thing and it actually works. And between, you know, the, the collective team and the management structure, there aren't incentives to replicate that. Uh, it's like, yeah, okay, that's great. Uh, we have work to do, let's get back to work. Um, people collapse into non-collaboration very easily and they move up into collaboration with difficulty. Um, I, I, and I think I've kind of come to the conclusion that that's the way people are, hmm. um, uh, you know, which makes me sad a little. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so, so then I apologize in advance. Uh, you'll read in my, my email, I go into, I get off onto, uh, AI stuff. I realized afterwards, after I wrote that and sent it, um, I use machine human hybrid. And I'm sure people will read that and go, okay, well, there's this little robot that looks like a human and has, uh, you know, a tenth of a brain working inside of it. And there's a person, and that's what people, or that's what Pete means by machine human hybrid. One of my favorite collaboration technologies is actually the stop sign. Um, uh, you've got, you know, two crossing paths, and you need to make sure people don't run into each other, people and, and, and cargo and horses and things. So you put up a stop sign and you teach people um, what a stop sign means. It means that you come to a stop and you look around and make sure that it's okay to go and then you go. And that rule, it's not embedded in the sign or anything. It's actually, you know, abstract. Uh, so 
um, I think of those things. That's uh, the sign and the embedded uh, information on how to use it is actually a kind of a technology. Uh, a stop sign and the attendant people and cargo going th and animals going through it uh, is, I think, kind of a cybernetic organism. Uh, so when I say machine, I basically mean some technology that's automated and a stop sign and an intersection is a machine human uh, hybrid to me. So I think, you know, there's, and, and we do that all over the place, right? A, a, a corporation, the corporation structure is kind of a technology. Um, tiny corporations, you know, two, three, five, ten people corporations, um, we're, we're just all operating as humans. When it gets to be a, a thousand person corporation or a 10,000 person corporation or a hundred thousand person corporation, it's actually a machine. It's moving by rules that, that humans set up and maybe that humans didn't set up. Um, and that again is a machine human hybrid. So I think, you know, there's, um, there's, there's ways that we can kind of cheat and augment collective intelligence. Um, so that's the good news. I think the bad news is, or, you know, I've, I've got, you know, in my old age, I'm getting to the point where it's like, turns out humans don't collaborate as much as we could. So I, I look forward to teaching more people how to collaborate better for more wikis to, to uh, rule the world. And, you know, I'm not actually as hopeful as I wish I were. <laughs> um, Kevin, you're really muted. Your voice is really kind of like you're talking out of a cheesecloth bag. He's looking for his earphones. <clears throat> uh, go ahead and, <clears throat> Kevin, go ahead and unmute. We can hear you. You're just really fuzzy. Um, and you're muted now. I see you've located your technology. There we go. Plug in, unmute. Sorry for all that. It was just when you said that humans didn't set up the rules, are you also of the opinion that HR is not human? Just curious. <laughs> uh, in ways it is, and in ways it's not. Um, you know, the rule set that HR operates by, there's, there, I, I would say there's a distinct lack of humanity in, in some of the ways HR works. And it's not necessarily bad, you know, um, when you have, you know, if you're Google and you have 100,000 employees or whatever, HR has to do things a certain way, which is different from the way that you would work with your family and your close friends. So it's a good, a good question, Kevin. Uh, anybody else? Thoughts? Uh, where would you like to... What would you like to add to the mix here? Because we're sort of adding ingredients to the soup. I, I was a social text user and, and really liked it. And why it works for me in Google Docs don't is because I could see this next to that. You know, I could go up and I could be at a taxonomy level and I can say, oh, here's food, here's water, here's, you know, a river. And on Google Docs, it's this row, and I just, I hate it. But at, at Social Tech, I could go up and I could find the connections, and I could make the connections, and I could weave them. And then I would assign an employee and then say, oh, really? Come on, can I just send you an email or a Google Doc? And I never got anybody who worked for me to really understand what I was trying to do with the wiki. But I really loved it. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I think I'm more like Bill Seitz in, in that it works for me. And I, I, even when I'm paying them, they said, this is this 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 help, this doesn't help my job. Almost all my employees said that the, 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 the wiki did not help them do their job. It was like, please, wouldn't you rather have me do the job? So, wow. Anyway, anybody else? I'm I'm struck by the <clears throat> one of my favorite sayings is uh, culture eats strategy for breakfast, uh, which may not be attributable to, to uh, Peter Drucker, we don't know, but anyway. Um, and this whole thing that there's really a deep reflection of, of culture here and care, <clears throat> and there's maybe three or four different aspects of culture that we're, we're poking at here. One of them is people's willingness to collaborate, <clears throat> just the willingness to share a document and to open up what you've done, and as opposed to I have all my documents and then every now and then I issue a command or a report and that's all you see uh, you know, of our interaction. 
uh, wikis are really about here's here's my work and here's the work in progress as it's sort of nakedly unfolding, and so that's one the, the, to share uh, first. Uh, number two is to collaborate while sharing and to edit well together. <clears throat> and one of the things um, that I love about Google Docs is that I find that uh, pair programming over a Google Doc is much is is really productive because both people are watching exactly the same document. In, in, in pair programming, and I don't have a lot of experience with pair programming actually, <clears throat> where one person has the keyboard and the other one is walking around watching and help, and, and they're collaborating that way. But to me, it, find, it seems like a very highly productive way to do it. Uh, unfortunately, in traditional wikis, which use markdown or some kind of lockout, <clears throat> you know, record locking for pages, you don't get that, that sort of tight collaboration on the page, which I think makes it harder to actually do the collaboration at a page level. And then, then there's this whole, whole, will you step up and think like a wiki um, kind of social thing, which is you have to learn a new dance. And, and this new dance is about wiki naming conventions and how we do this wiki. And you know, this is why pattern languages work so well in wikis is that <clears throat> people who are willing to consider a pattern language are already willing to consider how a wiki works because there's a series of sort of steps of, of how the wiki dance actually kind of happens. Um, so, and I think that you guys could probably uh, put in three or four other kinds of, of types of cultural interaction that get provoked by this whole conversation about wikis. And I'm, I'm saddened, like Pete was a moment ago, that, that more people don't want to step up and do it because when you learn the dance and you make a, a, an interesting document, it's, it's very, the flow is there, the document is really cool. Um, uh, it, it's easy for a bunch of people to, to do hive mind on this and to create, you know, a, a comb in a hive instead of uh, over there is like a cell, a cell made out of wax and over here is a mud hut made by a, a bird and over here is like a, 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 a little nest made by a, a robin. And they, they're, all, they're all like home, but they're not really the same home, right? And, and they, they don't collaborate, they don't share resources, they don't, they're not really actively in that, in that sharing mode. And I, <clears throat> that mode is a little bit like, you know, the f group flow of some sort that, uh, uh, that I think uh, is, is lovely to get and, and is rare because, as we're saying, um, somehow something about the tool, the combination of the tools and uh, the culture is not letting this flourish. While you're talking about culture, Jerry, I just, if I can follow on from that, and these are only observations I've been making while looking at the future of work and personal development through collaboration. So I'm quite struck by Peter's observations and disappointment that collaboration kind of doesn't seem natural at the, at the moment. What I would say though is we do need tools, online tools to be able to do this at some point. And where we are in terms of evolution, the tools that we do have really are primitive, QWERTY keyboards, markup. It's, it's, it's technology that makes sense to a minority. Um, I think collaboration will take a step change because it's going to have to happen. The economies are going to change. Power is shifting from uh, west to east. Um, anything can happen uh, which will affect us all on the way we work. Also modality or the user experience, I think is gonna change or it has to change for broader adoption. And that includes things like conversational UI. So rather than text-based interfaces, it's more agent-based. So you, you speak to, and I know it's controversial at the moment, but this is how I see things. You talk to a device such as Alexa, but they will be uh, populated with open source autonomous agents. So you can then say, go fact check this story or go find this product and organize the logistics for me. So it's disintermediation at the same time. Um, I've used, uh, because it's great that it's open, Wikipedia data. So you can download the entire corpus as a several gigabyte file. And then you can train machine learning algorithms. One I enjoy is word embedding. So you can end up, as long as a model is, it's biased, and it's, but this is all experimental for me. 
but you can end up where you can ask the model a question such as king minus man plus woman and the machine will tell you queen by training itself on uh, Wikipedia data. So I think what may need another enabler of this is decentralization. So Wikipedia is an encyclopedia and maybe we need other silos of collective intelligence which are just about music or just about politics or just about the alt, um, the intellectual dark web which you can mine and make sense from. And although it, it, we, we need to move up the stack so that the kind of network or sorry, graph databases that these systems will be built on, what we will interact with is voice. And as we were talking before, Jerry, just to finish on is video and audio mashups you can make sense from while you're doing while you're multitasking using wikipedia you have to focus on uh you have to do the work to find things there's no notion of context <coughs> it's all about link to this to link to that and you're doing the work so as as the world becomes more complex in order to deal with the complexity intelligent agents will be required so that's what I see. I actually see it's going to happen a lot quicker than most people think, you know, in the next five, definitely the next 10 years. I'm, I'm, I'm very intrigued by the, the notion of what I've, I've used. I, I think of them as listener apps, <clears throat> which are basically either watching a text stream or listening to you as you go. And they're responding. They're saying, hey, I think you talked about this. Is this useful? And should I do this? And, oh, you just did this. We usually do it this way or whatever. I think that could be really... Um, super useful in this context, and that would take a considerable amount of AI. I don't know. I don't know who's making good listener apps other than the obvious <clears throat> Siri, Alexa, uh, you know, Google Assistant, which are absolutely listener apps because they're busy listening to us and sending our our streams of of private, intimate family life somewhere on the intertubes. Um, <clears throat> but uh, you know, they're they're doing their best to try to figure out how to make a simple conversational interface at, at that level. But they're not. They're not helping us manage a particular task like editing a collaborative uh, document. Yeah, Clippy could be good here, but I'm not sure we want to revive Clippy, Dave. Um, I, you know, call me call me silly, but but Clippy did not get a big fan base. Um, so uh, one of the another one of the things that's coming up here, uh, John, you mentioned decentralization, and <clears throat> I think there's a really really interesting sort of uh, topological conversation here about you know the single user uh, using a wiki who is using the wiki because they like the intertwingularity of uh, wiki names you know wiki words that create page links and the the usability of that uh, to create their own corpus then there's sort of collaborative wiki then there's words uh, smallest federated wiki which i have to say i just don't understand and i had lunch with ward recently and we didn't specifically talk about this but i, I know a couple of people who were exploring uh, fed wiki and and running with it but then um, go, you know, go peek over the fence at GitHub, <clears throat> and there's things like Gitbook and so forth. The idea of, of a fork and pull as a topology for collaboration seems to have taken off like crazy. Um, I, I would say that GitHub is a, is a pretty resounding success, and GitHub killed SourceForge because, because I think, um, the collaboration methodology was different, and, and a fork and pull beat uh, benevolent dictator gets to say what it, what goes into uh, his or her code base, and that's it, right? Which is kind of the SourceForge model. I don't know what they called it. <clears throat> um, so, and then we're looking at DWeb uh, DApps, distributed apps, and, and that whole world, um, some of which are trying to do what some of these new all-in-one kind of applications are doing. And this, this all gets kind of wonky, um, but but the cultural dynamic of how we share and whether it's very promiscuous or not, you know, fork and pull says here, go make a copy and you will be inspired to come back and, and submit the copy to the original creator because that's where the crowd is. Um, unless you can somehow create something of val enough value that a bunch of people follow you to some other, uh, some other place. It's a little bit like uh, queen bees in a hive, uh, you know, and, and the setting up of a new hive kind of thing. I think metaphorically, that's not completely uh, bad. Anyway, um, any observations from any of you on, on uh, either the architectural side of this or the, the more of the culture? 
one of the things I was struck by, Jerry, is like the question, the guy that's asking the questions that academic at Duke and, and a couple of the other people in, the, in this group are also academics. And I think there's kind of an academic bias around, I mean, one is I was like, <coughs> all the, 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 you know, the, the right only stuff that academics do, you know, it's like stuff that nobody ever reads. Um, <laughs> kind of normal, is you're paid to produce it, you know, and it's not, you're not paid to have anybody use it. And so a lot of the ideas that were coming out of the group were of that right only model. Um, you know, if we put it somewhere, then it'll be, that's good enough. That's our job. Kind of. And, and I was, I was wondering if there's, you know, and I was trying to describe what little I know of like, you know, a product oriented thing where there's a customer, and how do you do a lean startup version of this? And, um, you know, of course it's very, you know, the, the East coast doesn't get this stuff kind of. So, uh, uh, it's funny, but I do think there might be these cultural enclaves where, you know, the knowledge management problem that you think about in business is really the same as what the academics are trying to do. Um, and I apologize, Kevin, you had yeah. raised your hand earlier. Go right ahead. Yeah, and just on collaboration, uh, I'm working oddly with, uh, or not oddly, whatever, <clears throat> with uh, Somali immigrants in Minneapolis on a housing solution. And it, it basically is, hey, we don't need a, they, they don't, they can't live with interest. So even if they could buy a house, they don't. Um, my, the entrepreneur who's leading it said, you know, he has six kids and he has a good job and his wife does too. And he said, you know, let's just go ahead and buy a house. And she said, you know, Saeed, we sleep in the same bed every night. Would you want me to sleep in a, in a bed soaked with sin? And he said, okay, I'll find a solution. <clears throat> uh, the, the outcome didn't seem good that way. So he came up with 200 people putting up 2,500 people dollars each to buy the first two houses and it, it, when we go and talk to somalis they said would you buy, invest in your neighbor's mortgage so, oh, of course i would do i get on the list and you talk to hamong and in, in, in minneapolis you talk to ecuadorians and, you know it's like of course I'll, I'll invest in my neighbor's mortgage and then you talk to like some of my friends who live in minneapolis and like, no I, I where would the property line be i mean i have a fence you know and, and they, and you get into stand my ground stuff and so i was i did a, a dinner and we were trying to explain why they did it and it was you know half somali half uh, white allies and we presented a little bit and then they broke into conversations and they realized oh like my friend who was the most um averse to this idea you know he's got a condo in hawaii he's got a, a house in minneapolis and a place up by the lake it, 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 he said you know and the only Somali I ever knew, you know, to know was a Lyft driver on the way to the airport. And these are like hardworking, smart people, highly educated. And, and he's, they're donating because they become human. But they, they can't imagine the culture. But, but almost any immigrant group, especially if they have saving circles, which they all do, and we're just doing saving circles here uh, in a totally new way with some allies leverage around it. So the Somalis have voice and vote. And the, the uh, and the allies don't, so that you know the Somalis keep doing it. Uh, you know, it makes sense to every immigrant because that's what they're doing. And it's like, as somebody said, you know, my this would make this is totally new, but it would make sense to my grandmother. So, if there's a cult, people who have been displaced collaborate because they have to, and and then people who think in property lines don't think that way, but they can still give once they realize these people are are people like me. Uh, Michael, jump in. Thanks, Kevin. This uh, brings to mind uh, a recent uh, piece by Daniel Schmachtenberger, uh, The War on Sense Making. I can put up a link to it in a minute. Um, where he talks about the rivalrous and anti rivalrous nature of the process and that we are so rivalrous in our culture that the notion of collaboration is something about risking, losing, uh, putting, you know, joining together in an effective way. Um, and then he extends to the concept of a substantial DAO. Um, though it wasn't an autonomous organization, what was it? Digital <clears throat> this, this DAO, or this decentralized autonomous? I thought, I thought that is. It might have been just exactly that. And he was pointing to the ability to extract information from the composite of multiple threaded um, uh, publications, basically. Something very much like Federated Wiki. Uh, so that instead of people looking for contention to argue about or to reject, to uh, abandon, dismiss, you know, oh well, 
obviously not, you know, forget it. You instead were finding the, um, the, um, the seeds of a common sense making. And that, I, I think, speaks to this entire issue of, that uh, Peter raised, you know, about collaboration, which we did. There's a, it's very funny. It feels good to dip back into the, the stream of collaboration because this has, I think, been a, a crucial and interesting topic for everybody who's on this call. I think that's what drew us to this call. <clears throat> it's surprising how little progress has been made. And yet, along the way, <clears throat> Wikipedia ate the world for encyclopedias and is a known thing. Like, when I give speeches, I use Wikipedia a lot as, a, as an example even though it's a little risky for a couple of reasons I'm happy to go into, but I use it because my first question is who, who has touched the Wikipedia even just to read a page in the last month? And 98% of the hands in the room go up. You know, who has edited a page, way fewer hands go up, <clears throat> right? But, but there, there's contact, people understand it. And my second question usually is, and I, I did a post about this recently called the two oh shits. Um, the second question is, do you remember that moment when you started to understand how Wikipedia works, that any idiot can come in and edit any page, <clears throat> right? And that's a big conceptual blockbuster for people. So to ground this conversation a little bit in the design from trust context, <clears throat> one of my premises is that we are so, uh, and here uh, Michael said rivalrous, I completely agree, we are so buried in layers of, of how things are supposed to work, how we do things, that when we hit a moment of vulnerability, a moment of risk, when we hit a moment of collaboration that looks like, an, eh, I don't get ownership of this, or they're gonna do what, or, or whatever, we balk, we, we start, because we're not, we're not accustomed to it. And, and I would submit that long ago on a planet, far, far actually on this planet, um, we used to live like that all the time. That, that was how communities actually were raised. And this is kind of knowledge we've successfully ground into the dust because it's important for our current cultural scripts for us to be you know, uh, greedy, self-interested individual economic units, the homo economicus, so we can go out and do our thing every day. And, and in the end, the invisible hand basically shepherds this also it works. That, that's, our, that's a different act of faith that we are perfectly comfortable with, apparently. Michael, go ahead, you were. Uh, except for Somalis. <clears throat> except for people who've experienced community. Who live in it. And who live in it, and who who understand, or or also, except for people who are um, who are sort of under some form of oppression, economic or bias or something like that, and who realize that unless they pull together, they may not all survive. I mean, this is partly why the Korean community in the United States uh, has tons and tons of grocery stores and uh, Taekwondo studios. <clears throat> they figured out how to do Taekwondo and stamp it out, put a little Taekwondo dojo in every town they could. Uh, and support each other to make it financially viable, right? So, so they, they figured out a particular economic niche and then filled it. Um, but the collaboration was in some sense necessary, which takes me to another little premise I have, which is that <clears throat> um, prosperity breeds laziness and sort of, in, sort of inward focus and, and, and sort of you, you move away from community because you don't really need it. <clears throat> and stresses actually help create community the, that, that Maybe everybody needs to be under a little more stress so that we will bond more and collaborate better. No, we've got enough stress. Problem. No, okay, now, you got plenty? No, I think one, one, two things I'd pick on there, excellent, agree with all of it. Understand, forget it. Let's not try and do this by understanding. And the, the other distinction is they did it. The Somalis are doing this. The Koreans did it. It wasn't just a theory. It wasn't the right brothers to pick up on the earlier comments about being right, white, ancient, and male. You know, so <laughs> doing this is, is the key, I think, that gives vitality to any such context, the ecology, collection of agents. Just to follow your Wright brothers mention over into a neighboring pool that I think is super interesting, which is about intellectual property. <clears throat> uh, the Wright brothers appear to have been legitimately 10 years ahead of everybody else in figuring out aerodynamics and pitch yaw and roll and how to do control surfaces and all of that. They invented the wind tunnel. They were experimenting with the shapes of pro you know, propeller blades and all that, even though they had the elevator out front and uh, you know, wing warping. But they were way out ahead. Then they started seeing people show up and take, take pictures in early movies at the fence outside their property in Ohio. 
and they basically stopped flying and then tried to protect their intellectual property, tried to sell planes to the American army who said no, the French army said no, the British said no, the Germans said no, everybody said no. And then Lewis, this other guy, shows up and starts selling actual planes to the military and puts the rudder in the back. Um, but the, the, the Wright brothers basically blew a fabulous intellectual lead because they were unwilling to cooperate around the emergence of a market. They completely blew it, like deeply blew it. Um, and so they're famous for having invented the thing, but not famous for having made it an industry, which other people did after them. And so another one of my bugaboos is IP over protection, which is peeking over the fence at us here. As we think about who owns the words, we're creating a shared asset, how does this work? You know, all, the, all that kind of stuff. And there was a, an interesting little startup more than a decade ago called Mixed Inc. Anybody remember Mixed Inc.? And Mixed Inc. allowed you to collaborate on a document, except every person's contribution was tracked. So at the end of the document, you could see who's at, who was attributed to what stretches of the document. And I'm not sure I like that. I, don't, I, I, think that, I think that I prefer the communal making of a, like a sourdough starter rather than here's a piece of bread and this loaf is Pete's and this loaf is Kevin and this loaf is Travis and, and this little, the, the button here is, is Graham um, and you know, go from there. But uh, how do you all feel? Go ahead, John. I just want to bring some of the, the, I think it's related, and just to throw this into the room, and it, it follows on from what you're saying there, Jerry, I think, um, and it's to do with why collaboration isn't working. I went to a festival on Friday in the north of England called Wuthering Bites, and the keynote speech was about lurkers. What do we do about lurkers? How do we bring them in? and help them feel part of a community and to contribute. I'm gonna use a profanity now, I don't mean to use it, and I've, I've since looked up the dictionary definition and it actually means fake or fraud, but it's a book by David Graeber called Bullshit Jobs. And it's something obviously I'm interested in the future of work, but he talks about this idea of financial feudalism and what we have are producers and consumers, then this huge hierarchy of middlemen or uh, agents that build a hierarchy and also drain uh, a lot of wealth out of the system. And that hierarchy is propped up by status. So again, that's another thing that's stuck in my mind with what Peter said is, I think a lot a lot of people are reluctant to collaborate, collaborate online because of feeling, um, you know, making a mistake or saying something that's offensive to somebody else or just feeling generally inadequate. And the problem I see is there's, there's so many people are trying to make sure that this hierarchy doesn't shift collaboration on a much wider scale isn't going to happen. Um, I mean, David Graver actually talks about, it's a strange thing to bring up, I know, but it made sense to me when I read it, but this idea of sadomasochism, that humans are actually almost wired to keep other people in their place. You know, they won't allow them. And to me, when you lose that, freedom to, to ask the question, to put your hand up and make a fool of yourself, almost, that, that the idea of free speech, just to say, what do you mean when you say that? No matter how good the tools are, people won't collaborate. They will, be, they will remain lurkers. So I hope that was relevant. <clears throat> John, thank you very much. I, um, and I, I meant to do some brain sharing earlier. Um, on several things that have been mentioned here because I've got a lot of stuff in the brain <clears throat> around these kinds of topics. Go ahead, Pete. So I, I love, uh, well, I love when people talk about economic feudalism because a lot of people don't. Um, I think one of the things that always strikes me about feudalism or economic feudalism, capitalism, um, it, it seems counterintuitive at this point. We can see a lot of flaws in it. We can see how it, disintegrates cultures, you know, things like that. Um, but I also go back and think that somehow 
at some point feudalism or economic feudalism got selected for um, it won uh, so um, I can kind of there's a there's a fuzzy thing in my head where I can see collaborative societies kind of get to a certain point um, and capitalistic societies um, get higher peaks maybe they have higher peaks and lower lows but the higher peaks can end up kind of rolling over essentially you know taking over smashing collaborative collaborative cultures so there's an interesting kind of you know fitness for purpose thing that capitalistic societies have provided us they provide higher highs much higher highs um, at the expense of having lower lows and probably a lower, you know, much lower average or something like that. So there's a, there's a guns, germs, and steely kind of question here that's been, been one of my big questions in the back of my mind, which is how do collaborative cultures survive the onslaught of militaristic cultures? Because capitalism goes hand in hand with violence, right? <clears throat> so it, it, there, there are people who enforce capitalism, and it used to be that East India Company had its own army. Um, and these days, our army actually is like a proxy stand-in to make sure they preserve rights. So, so when Jacobo Arbenz in Panama decides to nationalize the fruit companies, uh, sorry, Guatemala, uh, the CIA, the, 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 the Dulles brothers, basically, uh, the Department of State and the CIA send in a coup. <clears throat> and we overthrow the government. We overthrow a legitimately elected democratic government that is about to nationalize what is now Chiquita Banana, Chiquita International, right? Um, and, and, and so we do this over and over again. This is just a, a, pattern, a pattern that we do. So, um, so in some sense, Pete, my question is, is your statement that this system won a long-term thing or are we gonna figure out durable remedies in, in the meantime to how, how actually to shelter and protect collaborative culture where we protect the commons, where we do whatever else? Because this is one of the big questions of the day is do we just do we release do we do what trump is doing and release anwar for anybody to come in and dig and drill or can we find some way to be like a puffer fish where when you try to eat it, like when you try to eat the commons it spikes out and makes you know makes itself very unwelcome in your intestines so you have to barf it back out uh, this is what the hong kong protests are trying to do this very moment they're trying to say there are so many of us that Xi Jinping, if you do a Tiananmen here, which was one large square and some other city blocks, if you try to do Tiananmen here, you will not be able to digest us because the, you know, most of the population will rise and, and fight. So uh, Reigns, please jump in. And you're muted. <clears throat> uh, uh, thank you, as, as a lurker here. Uh, uh, you're de-lurking. I found a way to get me engaged. Um, I, I, the, what I've seen as a living in cooperative community and advising on it is there is an art to uh, communitizing or we like to say communifying to helping people think uh, in the, the tra transition from me to we. How do we get to where people are saying, okay, there's greater benefit from cooperating, from letting go of the need of ownership uh, the feeling of uh, need of control, the confidence that, okay, the results are going to be better. Uh, it may take longer to get there, but, you know, we, we get farther together, uh, maybe not faster. Uh, and and it, it's, it's really, it's, it's a personal journey and a collective education. And I see uh, all of us, including myself, on this path and easily reluctant to let go of what the culture surrounding us and what we've been trained in, that you need to hold on you need to control whether it's your home, whether it's your work style. Um, and even uh, I, in the wiki context, uh, I was seeing this with a neighbor that we were starting to use a wiki for internal documents in our co-housing community. And, and uh, so a neighbor, you know, uh, uh, reluctantly using technology was pouring in the meeting minutes that she was taking. And when I was ready to say, oh great, that's there, I can add value to it. I can add the metadata. And she was like, what are you doing changing my document? And uh, a little bit of an edit war until it was said, let's have a policy of not editing each other's documents for a while. Uh, and just, you know, the understanding is perceiving the on ramps and the journeys that other people are around to, to make it possible. That's really interesting. Do you have any things you'd like to do 
with groups when you start working with them. And for everybody else, Reigns is uh, Reigns and his wife Betsy are, are consultants in co-living, um, uh, basically co-housing, and uh, they help co-housing groups all over the world. I think uh, get started and figure out what the hell this is and get some some culture going. And I, I'm reminded a little bit to connect this a, a bit to Wikis of. Uh, Ward Cunningham's early trick. This was on an early social text uh, advisory call. Uh, he basically shared with us that his his way of getting some group started on a wiki is to start a page in the wiki and intentionally make a few errors. Like put, put something in that's blatantly, obviously the opposite of what you just heard them say. And the moment they shove you aside and take over the keyboard, you've started, you know, like, like you've begun to win right? Because you really don't want them to need you. You're not their editor to create the wiki. <clears throat> You're in fact merely the, the fire starter to get them started, started in the culture of wiki. And so this is acculturation. This isn't just a software sale. Just like Reigns, you're trying to get people to think about letting go of the need to have separate ownership of all the things that they mark as home ownership and community membership and whatever else. What, what seems to work? Uh, that was well, a long question, sorry. <laughs> I, I, I like you, the word said, you know, um, not showing up with a complete solution, not saying, okay, it's up to me to figure it all out and deliver something that people can see, yes or no, but something that has room for engagement and process and uh, meaning for them. I, and that's hard for me to overcome, you know, uh, professional writing, like, oh, I better get it exactly right and perfect and so well crafted that there, isn't, there aren't cracks that people can pry open as easily. Uh, but more generally, yeah, I'm showing up with empathy, showing up with a question. You know, it's like, okay, not here's what I want to do. I want to put an electric car charger in the parking lot, but where do you see your future in cars? How do you share my value about the environment? Uh, what, can, what do you think are possibilities? And then from there, build to our collective network to say, okay, well, we can get a grant okay, is that enough of a carrot to help us change our behavior collectively and do something different? Love that. Thank you, Rings. Something greater than the parts. Uh, so I posted way up higher. So this was reminding me of like Wikinomics, which is Don Tapscott's, you know, best management bestseller about, hey, look, the Wikipedia is so cool. Let's do management like this, um, which I never read, but I know Tapscott personally. Um, and then uh, Beth Cantor and others talking about working Wikily and much more the softer side of the culture and what it means to work in this way. Um, and I think we have many, maybe many different cultural interpretations of what it's like to live in this way and, and what it's like when you start trying to occupy the culture in this way. And we're seeing a whole bunch of things that are having a rough time, like uh, holacracy has had a hard time um, showing up in the world because it goes into places, there's too much focus on, on the, the, the thing, uh, things break and then you go elsewhere. And, and Valve Software has been, uh, one of the companies pointed to as, as a success story. And it turns out that, you know, Valve culture ain't so, ain't so awesome. So just trying to, trying to find our way toward what are the stories we tell, because maybe another thing that people are fearing letting go of here is uh, their historic culture and their grip on how we're supposed to do stuff. Um, because we're, we're asking them to take a step into uh, thinking of themselves differently. And it's contagious. It's, uh, it's, you know, once you start doing this with how you set hours for staff, then you start looking at how we set salaries, then you start looking at how we set boundaries, then you start looking at something else. And then personally, I love that string of, of ahas and the thing that hopefully results at the end of it, but I think it's really scary to a lot of people. Well, I was just thinking that some of because uh, you're right about economics, and I think if we're actually touching on some of the stuff that came, like Clay Churchy was writing about, with Here Comes Everybody and things like that, yep. which, again, is probably 10, 15 years old, right? At least. And, and I kind of, I was just, I mean, I was like, Bob Frankson had that question about why are we still using email? And it's like, well, why do we still listen to rock and roll? You know, it's like, it's what you grew up with, I think. And I kind of feel like at least for myself, my thinking is stuck about 15 years ago. This is why I think wikis are so good, but they don't work. And we haven't written the new book. You know, there's, I mean, I guess that's, that's, that's your charge, Jerry. We need the new book, man. But, you know, what, the stuff that I kind of accepted is like obviously good. You know, here comes everybody. Um, love these books, you know, and, and, you know, when I look back at them, it's like, well, actually, you know, it's not happening. So, 
And David Weinberger's uh, small pieces loosely joined, which Pete just put in the chat. Yeah, there's there's a there's a, a yeah, small be like a lot of work, right? There's a tiny genre of these sorts of things. Um, Howard Travis, any yeah? Oh, Howard, please. <clears throat> yeah, just to turn this conversation to a more instrumental level, I would point out that we're not using a wiki right now. Um, and yet we're conversing and collaborating. Um, and so, um, you know, the, one of the questions that I think about is what, what tool is right for what job that's at hand, right? And so there are certain cases when the group that I'm with, uh, we would use Slack or Mattermost and we wouldn't use a wiki to do what we would do on Slack or Mattermost, right? And so, um, I feel like, um, personally, um, 10 or 15 years ago, I was a good guide to the various tools that were out there. I, I used to keep up on this topic pretty, pretty well, and I don't feel like I'm a good guide to it now. I see a lot of new things, and I'm not quite sure how this particular tool would, would function, and, um, but then something takes off like Zoom, and then we all see, oh wow, that, you know, Skype was so limited. What we can do on Zoom now is pretty great. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I want to learn more about the various tools that are out there and, and how they work for the various, um, you know, jobs at hand. And, you know, speaking of Travis, you know, you know, consider it is, is um, um, you know, it seems to me it's designed very particularly and very specifically. And, and that's a strength, it seems to me. Um, uh, versus, you know, what Considerate does versus what, you know, any type of uh, smartocracy type platform would do. Um, so I wonder what Travis would think, say about that. You're, there we go. You're, there we go. Yeah, I guess I am. Well, yeah, I mean, you need tools for the, for the job. Um, and, I haven't really been keeping up on all the different technologies either. Um, I've been struggling a bit in this conversation trying to figure out kind of where some entry points are because we're jumping between a lot of different topics, obviously, because it's a pretty hefty thing. The question is focused around um, why haven't wikis eaten the world yet? And then, of course, we get down to the cultural levels and we're talking about largely, it seems like, why haven't or what would be necessary um, or actually more just why haven't we um, been able to create a collaborative commons-based society and how would it actually emerge into the world? So there's a question to me of like whether um, is that the necessary thing for technologies like wikis um, and other, I think Jerry framed it nicely at the beginning, other kind of participatory thinking um, collaboration technologies to become really dominant in the world. Um, so I'm not sure, like, that's kind of one, one question I have here is like, it, is that kind of big culture shift a re, a, almost like a necessary requirement for some of these things to emerge? Um, or is it that it, it's probably, the answer is probably more like, well, it's recursive, right? Like, you know, you kind of make some inroads, the tools <clears throat> make it easier to do some of these things and move you along the way. Um, but ultimately, you do need to be moving culture in a particular way. Uh, but anyway, so that's kind of where I'm at um, with this conversation, trying to figure out where to, <laughs> um, how to track it. So, so thank you. And, and I, think, I think we're gnawing on a giant social change issue, which, which a bunch of us have bumped into before and care a lot about. Um, I just posted a link to the video that I did a long time ago, which was a book review of The Great Transformation <clears throat> by Carl Polanyi. And the reason that's one of my favorite history books is that he describes the shift from pre-industrial society to industrial society. And, and, and the shift is so profound that we can't imagine now living in the way we used to live. And yet that's how everybody used to live before everything had a price, before you had to use money to get everything. Uh, everybody's like, well, it's either capitalism or, or communism, right? That's, that, 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 that's the only set of choices. And, and we have no imagination around this. We have no conversation around this. We have a shorter and shorter horizon looking backward, usually, unless we get people like Graeber, who writes a book like, you know, five th Debt, the First 5,000 Years, which is awesome. Um, uh, but, but if you, you have to go, you know, buy and, and read a book that's this thick, and people aren't doing that so much. So trying to figure out how do we, 
how do we reimagine how we used to live? The, the, the cool thing is that online, we've started to have experiences of the kinds of sharing and collaboration that sort of mirror how we used to live together. Like the commons, the information commons is, is uh, not weakened when you share it, blah, blah, blah. Uh, Wikipedia, which is the start of this conversation, is a lovely example of that, even though it's way too centralized, right? So I think we, we briefly touched on decentralization and, and how, my, how that might happen. But, um, but we're getting, one of my beliefs is that if we get enough tastes of design from trust, which is what I think of as the magic, the secret sauce that makes Wikipedia work, that is part of what we're talking about here is, is letting go of the need to own everything and sequester it for yourself because you trust that it will come to you later uh, when you need it in some other fashion, um, that we might have a phase shift just like we had a phase shift into industrial society. And so industrial so society needs econ homo economicus, all those kinds of things. And, and one, of, one of my favorite Polanyi quotes, uh, Polanyi is the author of The Great Transformation, uh, is that market economy requires market society. Like, like, so market economy, to get, to get markets everywhere you, so before the Industrial Revolution, uh, there's no land, labor, and money. Like, you can't go to Century 21 and buy a plot of land for your factory. Land is not free, it's owned by the king or the church, or inherited through generations or whatever. There's, there's, you, you have to tear land off the land so you can buy and sell it. There's no free labor force, everybody is attached, few, you know, through feudal relationships or indentures or whatever, whatever. And yes, there are coins, but everything doesn't have a price. Money isn't the way we, we value like, like, like wealth. Um, and so those three fictitious commodities come in and take over the world and take over our worldview. Um, and we're kind of at a, at a point now about like rethinking all those things. And there's, I'm trying to finish a, an op-ed piece basically to rebut or to comment on the business roundtables uh, announcement, uh, you know, 10 days ago that, hey, the principal reason to have a corporation is no longer only to feed the shareholders, it's now to feed uh, the stakeholders and to take care of them. Ooh. Um, anyway, it's, it's kind of hard because that, piece I'm writing is exploding in my head just as this conversation is sort of exploding into all these different neighboring issues that are all connected in this lovely intertwingled way, right? I, th I, think, I think we're not, I don't think we're wandering really far afield into, into distant lands where, man, how did we end up talking about, you know, major economic models and economic feudalism? I think these things fit hand in glove with the reason why there's a reluctance to understand how to use wikis and collaborate well in a company. I think these things are all tied together. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. Um, it's just what it, <laughs> you want to try to find places where there's traction to make steps. And I think that right. when, when you go into like the, the big issues, um, it's easy to get lost in them and then not be able to kind of trace your way back. Um, another, another, another area that we, I don't think we've talked about too much here that I think is another aspect of why um, wikis aren't adapted more or more just more broadly, like not just wikis, but like, being able to collaborate together. Um, ironically, I wrote a post that I haven't published um, about uh, trying to engender a culture of open thinking, um, which is kind of where you're, you're writing and, you know, they're kind of like you think openly and other people can, um, you know, react and, and also start to collaborate in there. Um, and that's uncomfortable. There's all kinds of different ways in which you um, can trample on other people's thoughts. But, um, the thing I want to point out is kind of more the psychology of this kind of thinking of like open thinking, um, integrating from an individual, from your mind, um, takes a lot of work, um, to move from your mind to articulate articulation work, very difficult. Like you can be, you can have a great ideas in your mind and then you go down and write it out and it's, it's at, you know, it takes a lot of time to try to formulate something. Well, um, now you take that over time and you yourself just articulating stuff is very challenging. And I know a lot of people here obviously have a good practice around that. That's a high energy state though. Um, and then you start to try to integrate with other people's thoughts. That's even harder because we have this medium that is language that is just, it's just not, it's not the greatest, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's very lossy um, and has lots of problems with it. Um, so then um, integrating, um, articulating your thoughts, and then, but also integrating them with other people. Integration work is another major component um, of, of effort. So what we have right now is we have um, collaboration um, and collaborative writing, collaborative thinking, collaborative discussions, 
organizations are all very high energy states. Um, so in the, and I think someone brought this up earlier that like the default would be kind of go into more individualistic kind of thinking, um, because that's a low energy state. Um, so one way to frame this might be to think about, okay, where are places where collaboration is actually a low energy state or collaborative thinking might be a low energy state. And I think that one of the places that we've already talked about a little bit, um, is when you talk about kind of conflict or communities under pressure, that's when the cost benefit ratio kind of really shifts. And maybe you can even look at it like an individual state is a high energy state compared to being um, collaborative. So I just want to make the connection between the kind of psychology of um, uh, thinking out loud and incorporating and collaborating out loud um, with the, the just the kind of effort there that is required and kind of tying it to why these things might not have taken on. Love that, Travis. Um, really, um, absolutely. And, and the sad note here is that stress seems to make collaboration cheap uh, in, in some interesting ways. And, and uh, you're reminding me here of Con Danny Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow, where he talks about system one versus system two thinking, where system one is your impulsive reaction, your knee-jerk reaction, which is often wrong, and system two is when you start to ponder and try to solve the puzzle and whatever. And one of the things I love about using the brain for all this time is that it forces me into system two every time I hit something interesting. It, it makes me go, oh, what is the logical type of this thing? Which means where do I put it? Uh, what do I call it? What is it related to? What else can I learn from it? Oh my God, it's a little bit like this thing I just put in a while ago. So I go find that and I figure out what is the bridging thought? What is the, you know, what is the collective... Uh, uh, concept that I can put both of these things under or do I just connect them directly because it's such a cool visible thing right and at one point I was looking up I was trying to find anything Brian Arthur had written on on virtuous circles and there wasn't much he just has not he's not a prolific writer um, and then I realized that um, virtual what's a virtuous circle for one player in the market is a vicious cycle for everybody else when Microsoft Word when Microsoft Office wins the Office Suite competition uh, Lotus goes away, WordPerfect and, and those guys go away, that they just die, right? All because of a bundling strategy. And so I connected vis uh, uh, vi vicious cycles and virtuous circles um, as being sort of uh, alternate parts of the same dynamic in the same situation for different players. That was, that was a, a really interesting thing for me by forcing myself to think through what I was trying to find and put in. So I, I think I, sh I share this a lot with Pete who, you know, in, in, in the dictionary of the future where the definition of maven is, there'll be a little dot graphic of Pete in the margin because he's like the world's greatest maven as far as many of us on the call can tell. Um, and I, I, there's something about being curious of the, about the world and then, and then the willingness to report back about it in some way, in some fashion, that, um, that is maybe too unique. I don't know. Thanks, Bill. Jerry, have you um, ever come across uh, Martin Sheffer's paper on Daniel Kahneman? Um, I, I wrote about it on, on my blog, and I'll, I'll post the link. Please um, do. How do you spell Sheffer's last name? A C A S C H. Sure. Yeah, and so he he's um, he's part of the broader kind of resilience network, and so he writes about uh, Kahneman's System One, System Two in terms of the fitness landscape or adaptive landscape, where System One is um, exploration and System Two is exploitation. So this this uh, John Holland's um, phrase about uh, uh, exploration and exploitation, right? Exploitation is is um, digging. Dig, making, uh, building resilience in, in uh, one's uh, accustomed, accustomed ways of being. And then exploration is, is getting outside of one accustomed way, ways of being. And um, it may lead to, um, as Kahneman emphasizes, it may lead to, to biases or false conclusions, but you don't get, you don't get creativity without getting outside of, of your, your current uh, um, basin of attraction, as it were. Um, one, of, one of the things I, <clears throat> I've come to believe is that actual innovation, um, hold on, that um, 
there's lots of improvements. There's lots of sort of uh, sustaining innovations that make something lighter, faster, cheaper, but that actual innovation usually involves breaking taboos of the old system. <clears throat> that you're, you're actually shattering something that the old system believes to be true. Meaning, uh, if, unless everybody's hungry and in, in the imminent danger of starvation, they won't try to find a job. That's a belief system on the conservative side of economic uh, policymaking. I think that's called the innovation paradox. Uh, is that the way it's, is that the way they frame it? I'll try and find a reference. Yeah. The innovation paradox, Dick Farson's book. The success of failure, the failure of success. Huh. I've never read it, but I've got it in my brain. <clears throat> Collective uh, intelligence, perhaps. Yeah, and, and so, so collaborative sense making and collective intelligence are two of my favorite kind of thoughts in my brain and things to think about and try to figure out why, where. Um, we're nearing the end of our time for this call. And do we want to set questions we'd love to sort of uh, examine? Or uh, what would what would make the time we just spent more valuable? Well, I got two pitches. So one is I was going to try to finish up this document and just have something that's like, I don't know, releasable or something. And if anybody wants to play, please do. Um, I don't know if I've gone too far or not far enough in terms of structuring it so that people can participate or not. But you know, Don't lurk, just go ahead and do something. Um, it could be much shorter. So probably just cut out. There's a, so much stuff going on now that the idea, it's probably easier to truncate than, than have everything. But anyway, I'd, I'd love to just finish it and say we did it. Um, and I can imagine if, if it works for this one, we could do it with more, right? There's a, I can imagine like using the list almost as a way to answer questions like this on the fly. If you could, if you could make it cheap enough, then you know, we could probably make it happen. So anyway, I'd love to finish that. And then the second one is, I just have this feeling like we need the new book, you know? I mean, I, I was so moved by, um, by Here Comes Everybody or, and, and Wikonomics. I read it very carefully. Uh, you know, a lot of my thinking, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago, about a generation ago, well, was formed by these books, so we need a new one. And so like, you know, what, what about doing the, uh, the uh, uh, book writing sprint with the group or something and, you know, grabbing a weekend virtually or in person and, you know, writing the next generation, why can't we collaborate book or how do we collaborate book? In a collaborative way. In a collaborative <clears throat> way. Um, does, model, model the tools. Does GitBook work? Does a, is GitHub usable as a fork and pullish substrate for writing books? Pete, do you have any experience on that or have you seen anybody do that successfully or is there a, is there a different platform that works well? Uh, I do not have specific experience with GitBook. Um, GitHub and Markdown is perfectly fine. Um, Fork and Pull is a model that is amazing um, and a cultural innovation, you know, that's going to stand for centuries. Um, for this, I would recommend uh, real-time editing sessions together um, and, and a wiki for, you know, asynchronous thought and longer, longer thought and, and uh, distillation and annealing. Uh, we didn't have a chance to talk about the all-in-one tools like Notion and Coda, and there's a bunch of these other things that started out as being spreadsheets on steroids um, and are now becoming sort of collaborative work environments where you can put anything on any page. Um, I just wanted to spend a minute on that. My own reaction to them is, oh my God, they're beautiful. Where were these 20 years ago when spreadsheets started? And my second reaction on it is I very quickly get turned around in the spaces. I don't know what page anything is on. Because you can mix anything on any page, I get lost real fast. Yeah, Airtable, exactly. Um, and so anybody have great experiences with these or, or love them? Uh, they seem super duper incredibly powerful because you can build lists, you can do charts, you can, like, you can embed kind of anything in any place and it's, it's remarkable. Anybody it's, adore it's, them? It's a trade-off right. thing, right? Um, when you can do everything and it's super easy, you get lots of particip participation at fairly low sophistication. When the tools are, you know, harder and and more to the point, more specific, um, and and more powerful, you get less participation and deeper participation. And I think that the Airtable slash Notion sites that work really well 
they work really well because there was one human who had just a really great genius brain for starting the organization and then gently enforcing people to stick to the organization so that it would live over time. Um, I think that's a, that's a big piece of it as well. Yeah. Um, so nobody, but nobody's charged up about these tools. Like none of you seem really like, Oh yeah, yeah. I've been, I switched my whole life over to notion or anything like that. Not happening. Or maybe you're all using grep and awk and sed and pine and elm. And like these tools are just way too modern for you. I think with notion, it's, I, I'm seeing a pattern. So we had the browser wars and the history tells us that Netscape lost the, 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 com the commercial war, but Microsoft lost in the courts. But what it did mean is Netscape then open source the rendering engine, the browser engine. Now, I think the same should happen to Alexa, the core technology Alexa and the, 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 the NLP model that they're using for language needs to be open sourced. And it's the same with Notion. If, no, if they made Notion open source, mm -hmm. what they provided was the bulletproof hosting environment for everybody to use cheap, I think it would be adopted maybe quicker than it does. But the fact that it's closed source, that's what makes me reluctant. Right. That doesn't help. I've been trying to convince Harlan to turn the brain into that version of what you just described for 20 years. And that has not, that I has not. Into, I got into wikis because the brain was closed source. Um, I, I, I shot a quick shout out for in this vein, Scalpel and Scrivener together. Um, Scalpel is an amazing brainstorming tool and Scrivener is actually kind of an outlining and document creation tool that tool chain that I can use. Um, it's not perfect. Uh, Scalpel, for instance, I, I dislike the, the hotkeys and they're, they're non-standard. Um, but so, so if somebody could dump a, a bunch of you know, effort onto to Scalpel and Scrivener to make them prettier and a little bit more user friendly and things like that. I, I'd be super happy. So just a comment, because I've been trying to use Scrivener to write a book <clears throat> and I like it and I hate it. Um, it's totally not intuitive about what goes where. I have to, every time I have to teach myself how to move a module, but really worse than that is that modules live inside of a book. And what I really want is for, so let me go back for a second. Kenneth Tyler, who alas is not on this call, but he was the founder of SeedWiki, which and I played with SeedWiki a whole bunch. Uh, he basically changed the code so that I could make SeedWiki look like PowerPoint and I could make SeedWiki look like a blog, which is sort of uh, what, Bill, uh, what Bill does with, uh, with Sites, SitesWiki. Um, but basically there would be one page in the wiki was a table of contents and it said, this is a presentation or this is a blog. And if it said, this is a presentation, then all the pages mentioned in the, the, the playlist basically would be put in order and a left, right arrow and you make it basically take over the screen and look like PowerPoint. And if you said, this is a blog, then all of the things in the playlist got put in a, in a thanks Travis. Um, I really appreciate your being here. Um, all the things would get pit, put in reverse cron order. So it would look like a blog. Awesome, fantastic. Um, so where was I going with bringing up Kenneth? Sorry, I just, I just noticed Travis was leaving and I, I hopped off my thread. Um, I like Scrivener. Scrivener oh, to create a book. You. Perfect, thank you. So what I really want with a Scrivener-like tool to write a book is a table of contents that floats over a whole series of modules that can be used and reused and repurposed in any book. That, that are basically shareable across books. And if I wanted to then fork, you know, uh, fork one of them out and adapt it to be, uh, to, so that it connects with the, ch the chapter before and the chapter after, fantastic. But, um, but that's the tool I really want. So Scrivener is, is also proprietary and, and has me completely stuck because I'm like, I now have like eight different kind of books or articles kind of stuck in different, lodged in different places. I now don't know where I put that module that has this interesting thing that I know I wrote. Is it in this one or in this one? And I really can't stand um, the, the, the enforcement of these boundaries between documents, right? I want a document to be just like a pointer to a series of things that, connect, that, I, that I'm connecting on the fly at runtime. Uh, and I will, I will customize them so that they actually flow like text because, you know, as I said in chapter two, blah, 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 you need to do that. But, but I want to do that on the fly kind of at runtime. Could we write my, a tool that does that? My, 
hypothesis, and I have not tested it, uh, is uh, you can do what you want uh, with Git and fork and pull and uh, something called Sphinx or oh. make docs, MK docs. Um, and then to get what you really, you're talking about, I think you'd, you'd write some custom templating on top of the, the output of Sphinx. Hmm. Um, and Sphinx is basically a runtime compiler for modules and Git? Uh, like for, for text, it, it's, they're, they're both uh, book assemblers. Cool. You know, That's really interesting. Book assemblers, but. Yeah. Huh. That there think there are big uh, commercial equivalents to them too, which I forget what they are. But. For documentation compiling, basically? Yeah. Technical, technical docs? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, there's one really good one now. Um, there's some ancient ones that, that are, are un, unfriendly and unhappy, but there's real, one really good one now. Sweet. I'll have to look it up. Any last words on this call for anyone? Want to put a bow on it? We, we haven't heard the last of this. Yes, <laughs> that's right. You haven't heard the last of us yet. We still have some energy to, to, to sort this out. I gotta say, I stuck, a, I stuck a note into this document that I wrote you know, a long time ago. And one of the things it has is a table of like internet uh, pioneers that were you know, made, that I used in the, in the document. And it's like 15 people and they're all white men. And oh. it's great to see a bunch of old white men on the call. <laughs> we, we do own the future. Uh, so if we do run another call like this, what should the title be? And can we each bring a person who is not a white male to the call? We should call it the Wright Brothers. <laughs> is is the next format? I, I would think the next format is a few working sessions with smaller smaller groups. Yeah, yeah. And so let's use the design from Trust list. Uh, is everybody here on the DFT list or not? I don't think I am. OK. Um, I can put you on it, or we can use some other thing to coordinate this. Um, uh, or I could send out a stupid email with all of our email addresses on it, uh, whatever you prefer. But let me just send, uh, so Dave and Pete, let me get you on the, on the list. Reigns, are you in DFT? I don't believe I am. Uh, would you like to be? Sure. Okay. Uh, and, and on diversity, I'm, I'm torn a little bit. I think, I think on one hand it is what it is. So this call was great, even though we're all white men. Um, <clears throat> um, I, miss di I miss the diversity. Uh, in some of my efforts now, I, or another hypothesis I have, is that some efforts aren't worth pursuing until they're diverse enough. Um, so there's a trade-off between, let's just get shit done, and yeah, whatever, if we get, you know, 80% or 20%, you know, people who don't look like us, then let's just go ahead and do it. There's another part of me that says, it, it's not worth doing unless you know, unless you've gotten, you've, you've grown a rich and diverse enough community to start moving forward. And, you know, if, and, and once you get started, you know, once you're down the road, you can't switch, right? So right. you have to, you have to start with a, a better uh, foundation of diversity. Yeah. Um, and <clears throat> architecture is destiny. And basically when, <clears throat> when architecture gets poured early, it persists and uh, it, it doesn't do well when it doesn't match other people's needs. So yeah. I agree with you. All right, so let's try to, let's have another one of these and let's try to diversify the, the conversation, get a little, a little better at that. But thank you all. This has been completely, um, completely fascinating, entertaining, hopefully useful, and uh, a great way to spend a piece of Labor Day. Thank you for being here. Thanks, everybody. It was fantastic. Bye, Bye for now.